exactly what it is. Uh, but more than anything, our hope is that we will continue to be a people that reminds ourselves that there is a community of faith, of faithfulness, a community of followers of Jesus that span time and history. How many of you know that in every era of human history, God has always revealed God's self to humanity? That there's never been a season where God was not known in the earth. Hello, somebody. And we as God's people, we as the church are the, I believe, the greatest expression of God's continuous revelation to humanity. That God has revealed God's self through the life of Jesus that we believe in our, in our tradition that God literally takes on human flesh. The theological word is kenosis. God empties God's self. As much as God could fit in one body, that's who Jesus was. Amen. I know some of you feel like you got a lot of God in your body. Amen. You never ever met somebody who felt that way? It is like they think they are God on earth. Amen. Well, I want you to know you, you may have a lot of God in you, but Jesus had the most God. The most of the divinity that could fit in a human body, that's who Jesus is and was. And Jesus uh, found himself through the course of his life on earth uh, exemplifying a way of existence that compelled both enemies and friends to pattern their life after the way Jesus lived. And that has existed, that tradition, for well over 2,000 years. And we are a part of that tradition. And that's why we call ourselves followers of Jesus. Some people call themselves Christians. Uh, the collective, we call ourselves the church. And it is so important for us to realize that this church, uh, global church, was not established by some European colonizers in the corner of England or Europe to oppress the world. I mean, no, there was, God was here before Europe was here. Somebody say amen. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I'm glad God got here before Europe. Amen. <laughs> amen. God stepped out of eternity and said, hmm, I think I need to just hang out here on this earth for a little while. And if God is the original source, then there is no one that can manufacture God. Even when humans try to distort God. How many know God knows how to wiggle out of your distortion? Ooh, I feel like preaching already. You know, I just wiggle your body and say, I'm glad God can wiggle out of my distortion. All my little weird ideas. How many grew up with some weird ideas about God? Like God was an angry parent, you know. Like God, if you do anything wrong, God's going to strike you down with some lightning. And he's like, man, I can't wait till I get old enough not to go to hear that preacher talk about God because I'm afraid of God. Or you think God is, you know, an old white guy with a long beard. <laughs> or you think God is a mean entity that just likes to destroy worlds and like Thanos or something. We just got weird distortions about God. And that's okay because God's revelation is often mediated through us, through human beings. But that's why a tradition is so important because over time, I believe that God wiggles through and out of our traditions and the revelation of God becomes so real to some of us where the old saints used to say, you can't make me doubt him. I wish I had a, a church that understood them old songs. Anyway, I anyway, heard, your, heard, your, heard your grandma say, you can't make me doubt him. You can't make me doubt him. You can't make me doubt him in my heart. You can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. You can't make me doubt him in my heart. Y'all never heard that song, huh? This little song old, old, old grandmother used to sing. And you know, them songs, they were so good, they would just make them another verse. It says, I got the love of Jesus. I've got the love of... Yeah, I'm not going to mess with y'all today. We, 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 we supposed to be preaching, praise God. But it, I feel a little song in me already. But the idea was that even amidst all of the contradictions, 
God's revelation wins out. And that is a great promise you ought to internalize in your own life. That even amongst the dissonance of life, the challenges of life, the vicissitudes, the ups, the downs, the roller coaster of life, God will win out in your life. You ought to pass over the chest that God's going to win out in my life. Amen. And, and it, it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to have some tears. It doesn't guarantee you're not going to have some disappointments. As a matter of fact, you will have all of those things. Because following the ways of Jesus does not absolve us from struggle. It just guarantees that we will come out on the other side. And just in case this life takes your life, the ultimate guarantee is we will live forever. I mean, I, it just seemed to me like, man, that, I, it, you know, I'm, I'm in a win-win proposition with this thing. And so I and we then live in light of that guarantee. I don't have to fight with you. I don't have to argue with you. <laughs> I can just live like Jesus lived and trust that my life is in the hands of God. So this is the passage that we're reading today. First Peter chapter number two, the very familiar passage of scripture. I love this passage of scripture. Grew up hearing this passage of scripture so many times. If you've been here at the way, you may have heard me preach it a dozen or so times over the 20 years we've been here at the way because it is, uh, for me, a bedrock uh, text that I think is so critical. I'm going to read it from a couple of different versions because I just love the way it reads. Uh, and uh, we'll take a look at what those scriptures are telling us. First Peter chapter number two, verse number nine. Uh, we'll put it on the screen. The first version is the New Revised Standard Version. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of God who called you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Verse 10, once you were not a people, Ooh. but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Uh, let's look at the, the, the message translation. I, I like the way it reads. It says, but you are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do God's work and speak out for God. To tell others of the night and day difference God made for you. From nothing to something. From rejected to accepted. Friends, this world is not your home. So don't you get too cozy in it. Mm, I know some of y'all don't like that because you're like, I'm, I'm cozy. Uh, let's go to my last one, the voice version. I, I like the way this reads. It says, but you are a chosen people set aside. Somebody say set aside. To be a royal order of priests. My Lord. Some of you thought, you know, the priest's function was reserved for only a few. But this is a collective declaration. A holy nation, God's own, so that you may proclaim the wondrous acts of the one who called you out of icky, inky darkness into shimmering light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received it. Beloved, remember you don't belong in this world. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Scriptures have given us these words. The title of the sermon today is simply going to be, uh, this is who we are. This is who we are. God bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and allow the preaching and teaching of your word to your people today to be done with anointing that makes the difference. And we'll say thank you, God, for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. amen. Somebody holler, I can't forget amen. who I am. Now, since the onset of COVID-19, 
it has been studied, it has been certainly underscored that we as a globe have experienced a once in a generation interruption in our social life. The rates of loneliness, isolation, self-harm has literally spiked. And in some parts and corners of our uh, culture in our world, we've seen the coarseness, the inability, even though we have so many more ways to interact with one another, we've lost the ability to connect deeply with one another. In the United Kingdom, uh, I believe in 2016, 17, they created a ministry of loneliness. The government there created a whole part of the Great Britain, United Kingdom government because people were experiencing such loneliness and isolation in the country that they realized this has become a national emergency. What COVID introduced and certainly brought to scale since 2020 has been a very similar crisis. It has brought the expression and the evidence of massive anxiety, massive stress, massive isolation. And for many of us who survived the pandemic, many of us did not come out unscathed. Many of us had lost friends and relationships, marriages. Some of us have found our careers upside down. And one of the casualties of the last several years we have found has been what uh, one scholar declares is the loss of the third space. And I was so, and have been so uh, compelled by this idea of the third space because, you know, it is this notion that we all as human beings have various places and spaces where our lives are helped to make meaning coming from either our home life, coming from our work life, and then coming from a third space that is not your home and that is not your work, but a third space, a space of social belonging that we choose to participate in to help us make sense of the part of our human constitution that your family can't speak to, that your career can't speak to. How many of you know that you are more than just who you are in your family? How many know some of us, we didn't get to choose our family? <laughs> All of us. <laughs> you hear folks talk about these, these are my chosen family, right? Because there is this sense that in a part of your human constitution, there is a space of meaning making that goes beyond just your narrow familiar circle and your work life. What I love about the third space kind of idea is that it is a place where you and I can belong, can find community, can find a place like Cheers and them used to say, where everybody knows your name. And you're always glad you came. Man, I'm dating myself, because don't nobody know that song. Yeah. Don't you want to be where what? Everybody knows your name. We have often not been able during this season of transition and difficulty to maintain third spaces. The pandemic literally caused most of us to have to shut down third spaces. And how many of you know, I remember when I was at UC Davis before I flunked out for playing too many video games, not going to class, uh, but I was in the engineering, uh, I mean, who goes to school to be an engineer and don't want to go to class, but that was me. And my mentor uh, was telling me that if you did something 19 days in a row, it becomes a habit. So he was trying to get me to go to the library 19 days in a row. It's like, I know you don't want to, Mike, but if you just, just do it 19 days in a row, you'll wake up and you'll be like, man, I got to go to the library. And I can never get past 
two or three. It just, just got stuck at two or three, and therefore I had to come home. Somebody say amen. But during the COVID pandemic, how many know we spent more than 19 days in quarantine, 19 weeks in isolation, 19 months? The country was shut down as it should have been because of this pandemic, and we are still living through this pandemic, even though no one's talking about it like we used to. How many know that we just experienced a massive spike, and some of us are still dealing with the aftermath of these things? And I believe that one of the gifts of Back to Church Sunday is that it gives you and I an opportunity to be reminded of the gift of intentionality when it comes to building community and reminding ourselves that we are social creatures. This is how God made us to be. God made us to be in relationship with creation. And how many know that you and I are part of creation? The sun, the moon, the stars, nature, creation. And yet God has a unique role for you and I to be in relationship with one another. And I believe that one of our most important tasks as the church is to be one of the third spaces where we can gather and you can always find a place to belong. Find a place to be. Not always agree, not always be on the same page, not always share the same ideological uh, uh, considerations, but at the very least, I know that there's a place where I can show up and arms of love, embrace will be there awaiting me. Now, one of the great gifts of, of this third space concept, particularly, you know, people who are, you know, scholars and wanting to figure out how can these ideas be a source of liberation? They, they also went a little further and they said that a third space is where the oppressed can plot their liberation. The third space can be a whispering corner of a tavern, of a bar, of a club, of a park, of a book club. It is a place where you can huddle away from the gaze of those forces that are stealing your humanity. The third space is also a place where the oppressed and the oppressor are able to come together and live out a life of freedom. Woo, I, I, I don't know about you, but I want the way to be a third space. I want us to be such a compelling destination where we show up knowing, number one, Somebody here is going to make sure that I feel like I'm missed when I'm not here. There's going to be some programming. There's going to be some energy. There's going to be some messages. There's going to be some people who will attach themselves to not just me as an individual, but to my family, to my network of friends. That this is what it means to be followers of Jesus, and I must tell you, one of the great gifts of the Spirit is that we can be individual, but God knows how to bring us together without you losing your distinctiveness. God is not trying to create a clone. God wants you to be everything that you have been created to be. God just wants to put it all together like a kaleidoscope. So it can show the wondrous beauty of God's creative power. And when you and I come together under this kind of belonging framework, we then become the expression of God's creativity in a world that is looking for God. Everywhere you go, I believe somebody's looking for the divine. A spark, an expression, a touch, a description, a manifestation on your job, through your vocation, in your career, in that which you write in a poem or sing in a song or, 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 or publish in an essay. God is trying to show God's self to creation through us. And it is this showing of God to creation through us that I believe marks why you and I are God's handiwork. 
Because there is a moment and a season in your life where a light bulb should come on and realize I am here for more than just myself. I'm here because God has God's hand on me. Can anyone just think about uh, that moment when you start to realize, man, God's hand is on me? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe when you start to realize, you know, God, you, you, you dabbling a little bit too much in my life right now. What's going on? Anybody ever had a season in your life where you didn't have no notion of God? You weren't thinking about God? People just have God and be like, oh, God, what are you talking about? And now God is just all up and you wake up and God's on your mind. You go to sleep, God's on your mind. You show up at the club, God's on your mind. You with your boo, God's on your mind. And God is just all in. Anybody ever had that kind of season? I don't know about you. The scripture says that no one comes to God unless God draws. And how does God draw us? The scripture says that God draws us through God's love and kindness. Whoo! That means, beloved, that if you and I are expressions of God, then we must be the most potent expressions of love and kindness. Why? Because there are people around us. Maybe, maybe you sometimes who are so unloved that you begin to internalize the absence of love, the absence of purpose, the absence of God. This is where I find this text to be so powerful because you find followers of Jesus literally in the first generation after Jesus was here and they themselves are trying to navigate through the culture of the Roman Empire, an empire that has figured out a way to oppress the world. <laughs> I mean, you gotta think about this. The Roman Empire had little satellite empire stops through most of the known world. So wherever you went, you can maintain your individual or even your collective identity as long as you gave your taxes to the emperor. And there was this sense that now that I'm a follower of Jesus, does following Jesus matter when I have the Roman Empire telling me that I belong to empire? I don't know about you, but it feels like to me some days we live in that same kind of space. Does my life matter when I'm constantly being described by empire as a failure, as a criminal, as a Democrat, as a Republican, as an immigrant that eats cats and dogs. Does my life matter when I'm being described as unhoused and unlearned? And it's a deficit framing that continues to catch fire on every single social media channel, even when the evidence says different. And in the course and in the face of all of that, I hear the word of God saying to you, yes, your life matters. And no, you are not the worst description that catches fire. As a matter of fact, I hear the word saying you are God's chosen people. Lord, help me to preach in here today. That your life not only matters, your life is described by the creator of everything. And part of our task is to keep reminding one another of this truth. Because when you forget that you belong to God, then you will allow your life to be lived on the terms of those who describe you as less than God created you. You ought to be someone that walks into every place and be like, I belong to God. Oh, you may treat me foul on this job, but guess what? My boss ain't you. <laughs> Certainly, I want you to give me my check, though. <laughs> Man, just you know, keep, keep the check coming. But you're not my boss. My promotion does not come from the east or the west. My promotion comes from God. God knows how to elevate me and mine in due time. And how many of you know that sometimes you may never get elevation on your job, but you'll get elevation somewhere else? God, oh, you know, one of the great things about the old school black church, they used to say, you know, that that one of the reasons why old school black church people dressed up is because during the week they had to wear tattered clothes. 
They were the help. They were the higher. They were uh, the ones that did work that was deemed lowly in society. They were called boy, and they were called a girl, and they were called names. But then on a Sunday morning, they dressed up, and they were deacon. They were missionary. They were bishop and pastor. Their elevation didn't come from the social context. Their elevation came from another place. And I want you to know, beloved, that your elevation may not come from the place where you are right now physically, but God has another place that God can elevate you and give you the confidence and the space you need to be everything God's created you to be. Because you're more than your career. Oh, give your neighbor a high five and tell him you're more than your career. God has chosen you. And let me say it like this to you, beloved. God choosing you doesn't mean that you are God's favorite over someone else. <laughs> it means that God has chosen you for an assignment. You have a purpose. You have a function in the world that is unique to you. And our job is to keep cultivating that with one another, to keep reminding one another that I have a purpose. When you look at the text in the book of Genesis, God chooses Abel rather than Cain. God chooses Jacob instead of Esau. God chooses Isaac instead of Ishmael and Rahab the harlot over the rest of Jericho. God chooses David over Saul. God chose Esther instead of Haman. God finds ways to see in us what we cannot see in ourselves. And God says, I'm choosing you for this assignment. And the great thing about when God chooses you, it don't mean God rejects the person next to you. Uh, because in the abundance of God, God got enough for everybody. Aren't you glad God got enough for your neighbor just like God has enough for you? It is the lie of empire that makes you think there's not enough. How can there not be enough when God creates with abundance? When God creates with enough for everyone? It is only the greedy among us who only uh, acts as if there's never enough. No, the devil is a lie. There's enough for everybody. There's enough homes for everybody. There's enough food for everybody. There's enough water for everybody. We need people who can live out of the abundance of God, but we have to be reminded this is who we are. Even though I may work in a scarcity environment, I will not become scarcity. Even though I may have to exist in a violent society, I will not become violent. Even though I'm surrounded by hopelessness, I will not lose my hope because this is who I am. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so when I... And you remember who you are? Listen to this question. If we know that God has chosen us, what does this teach you about your value? Ooh. I remember, you know, when I was uh, a little younger and a little more uh, athletic. And we would go play basketball at Hunter's Point or... You know, sometimes we played, uh, you know, different parts of, of the bay. And, and you know, uh, I, I was, you know, a little quick point guard. You, you, may, you, you have to use your imagination, amen? And, and you, know, I, I, you know, I had a nice little baby hook. My favorite player was Magic Johnson. I had no look pad. You know, I was, I was kind of clean, you know. Had a little something on me. Somebody say, man. And so whenever, you know, you, 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 you picking your squad, I was always glad to never be the last one chosen. Because I had something to contribute. And there used to be, oh, how come I'm not the first one? But at the, after a while, I, I just was glad to be on the team. And you know the great thing about being outside playing basketball on a, on a blacktop is that the winners stay on the court. She's a baller, if y'all don't know. <laughs> She's one of these people who just like to take the court up for the whole day. She don't believe in abundance when she plays basketball. She's, <laughs> she's a, turns into a another creature somebody say amen <laughs> but the great thing about it is there's always a chance for others to get in the game what I love about the way God fashions the world is that when we live in abundance we always find place and space to value 
others. When we are clear about our own value. Some of us are not clear about our own value. That's why we're so stingy. And we hoard. Because we think that someone else is a threat. You know who the greatest threat to you is often? Is yourself. Now be clear, there's some threats externally. We'll talk about that in a second. But I have found even when external threats come, as long as I stay clear about my value and my value is tied to God, how can you lose value when you're tied to God? Just think about that. How do you lose value when you are connected to the one, the source? Who the scripture says called you out of gloominess, out of spaces of isolation and loneliness into the marvelous light. If God has called you, if God has chosen you, if God has assigned you, your value never diminishes. Your position may diminish, but your value doesn't. You may get fired off your job, but your value don't change. That relationship may end, but your value don't change. Your money may get funny, your value don't change. You may lose this opportunity that's before you. You may fail in your business. You may fail with your kids. You may fail even with yourself, but your value does not change. Why? Because God sustains you. Do you have the confidence to know that there is no circumstance where my value changes as long as I'm connected to God? You may not believe it, but I believe it about myself that God sustains my value. Lord, have mercy, and I can't forget who I am. Uh, The second thing that I want you to be reminded of, beloved, is your purpose is connected to your positioning in God's order. Now, this is such an important notion, beloved, because when the scripture says that we are a holy nation, It is attempting to distinguish ourselves from an unholy nation. How many know that every expression of kingdoms, nation states, governments that seek to create the hierarchies, These levels of value are unholy expressions of God's intended relational order. God wants you and I to live in relationship with one another without diminishing one another. When the scripture says that you and I are a holy nation, a strange people, people that God has put in deep relationship with one another. The best way that I can think of this is St. Augustine. He wrote this wonderful, wonderful political uh, 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 ideology in uh, fourth century, something like that. It was called the city of God. And in his ideology, he, he talks about that there are two kingdoms in the world. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. grabbed that notion and he began to tease it out and said that we as citizens of both kingdoms at the same time, we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We're citizens of the kingdom of this world. And we are navigating our lives through these kingdoms that are running literally parallel at the same time. But there will be moments where the kingdoms become in conflict with one another. And you and I must be people who are living so purposefully and conscious of who we are that when the kingdom of earth asks of us something that the kingdom of heaven requires us to reject, we must be clear about which kingdom gets the priority. When the kingdom asks you to be an agent of death, you have to say no. The kingdom of God asked me to be an agent of peace. When the kingdom of this earth asked you to be an agent of hatred, you must reject and say, no, the kingdom of heaven requires me to be an agent of love. When the kingdom of heaven requires you and I in the face of wickedness to stand for righteousness, justice, 
We have the capacity through God's spirit and through our community to never have to stand alone if we don't forget who we are. If we remember that I'm not just a holy person, we, somebody say we, we are holy people. Anybody ever been, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit like Jay Red, you know, I, you know, we're, you know, I like cocoa butter communion too, amen. It's just, just little, you know, little, little, I ain't gonna say ghetto, we just like your hoodish, he said hoodish, right? Hoodish, not ghetto, we just little hoodish. You ever been into a little hoodish situation where, you know, there was a conflict and you was by yourself and you got some people that, you know, they got like a whole bunch of people and you, you know, uh, I'll never forget I was in school and, you know, bro tried to told me he, I took his phone and I said, you know, I didn't take your phone. He was like, yes, you did. I was like, no, it was a pager because we got a pager phone. It probably was a pager. And, and I, I said, I didn't take your pager. He said, yes, you did. I said, no, I didn't. He said, yes, you did. I said, no, I didn't. He said, yes, you did. I said, bruh. You know, in class, you know, when you're in class, you little knucklehead, want to be knucklehead, you know, you can get real bad in class. You know, the teacher's there, you know, security guards outside. So, you know, raise your voice, get kicked out of class, go to the principal's office for a little while, get some water on the way, and then you come on back to class. So, you know, it turned up a little bit. I said, I didn't take your phone. And, you know, he's like, well, I'll see you after school. I was like, fine, what are we going to do? <laughs> we get outside, and, you know, he got his people outside. So, you know, I'm like, huh. My boldness and audacity by myself. <laughs> it was a little, you know, it was a little, little different. Then I seen some homies walking up the street. I was like, yeah! <laughs> I said I didn't take your stuff. And all of a sudden, my courage came back. Anybody ever been in a situation when you by yourself, you kind of can feel a little less confident? about the impending crisis that is facing you, but when you got some backup, you feel like you can take on almost anything. Well, this is who we are called to be as a holy people, a holy nation. And when one of us suffers, all of us are supposed to rally around one another. When they're talking about our Haitian loved ones, all of us should be rallying around them. When they're talking about our incarcerated loved ones, those who are easily and overly criminalized, all of us should be rallying around them. When they're talking about our queer loved ones, we should be rallying around them. When they're talking about our immigrants and undocumented and our unhoused, we should be rallying around them. Why? Because these are groups of people who make up God's holy nation. Amen. And in this society, they would want to make you believe that you are different from them. That's their problem. How many know that I and we and you are called to be a holy nation? A solid group of people that have been, as the scripture says, set apart for a purpose. And so my final question to you, beloved, today is what purpose have you been set aside for? Some of us may not be clear about that just yet. Some of us are clear about it. There are two ways that being a community can help us. The first way it can help us if you're not clear is it can help you get clear. Because sometimes you need the iron to sharpen the iron. Sometimes you need some skilled, learned, experienced folk to see in you what you can't see in yourself. Sometimes you need to be mentored. Sometimes you need to be encouraged. If you're going through a situation and this is your first time, and you're in a room with someone who's going through it 10 times, how many know that I want to learn from the person who went through it 10 times? Not because they didn't learn anything. Obviously, they did because they're still here. How many know I want to fail as much as I have to in order to succeed? This idea that you got to do it all right, there's no place in the world where that exists. Do you realize basketball, football, I love sports, obviously. No one is 100% right and perfect in the sport. And people are still champions. You could be a champion and miss half of your shots. <laughs> you could be a baseball champion and only hit the ball one out of three times. 
Hello, somebody. You can be a champion when you miss most of the time in your sport. How is it then that we have convinced ourselves that the only way I can be God's people is to do it right every time? No, beloved. You know how you become God's people? You keep doing it. And the more you do, the more you become. The more you become, the more you reflect. The more you reflect, the more you are. That which God created you. And I believe we find that together in community. If you don't know, you come and you get a little bit of help. If you do know, guess what? You come and sharpen yourself, but then you also become a blessing to someone else. God save us from this idea that everything I've got, God gave it to me so I could have it for myself. The scripture says it like this, that you are blessed so you can in turn be a blessing. Who are those that you are called to bless, beloved? Oh, some of us say, oh, Pastor Mike, I don't have a lot. You have more than somebody. <laughs> Oh, you may not be Bill Gates or who's the other guy that run Amazon, uh, Bezos. You may, not, you may not be a billionaire, but you don't have to be a billionaire in order to be a blessing to someone else. Our task as God's people is to not forget who we are. In the face of all that will tell you the opposite. Our task is to keep reminding you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are God's handiwork. You are God's instrument. You don't belong to this world. You belong to God. And it is in that that we become God's people. Let's stand to our feet, everyone. Let's prepare ourselves to pray. If you don't mind, grab the hand of someone next to you. God, we say thank you, Lord, that you continue to remind us how much you have allowed us to endure. Not for our destruction, but so, God, we can, through the course of our life, learn how to be your people in relationship with other people. So, God, I pray for the person who I'm touching today, their hands. I'm grabbing a person who has been chosen by you to be a part of creation that lives in and through abundance. I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you will do something with them and through them today that reminds them of who they are. If they've forgotten, God, I pray that even right now, God, as we pray and as we hold hands together, as we, God, reflect and as we offer our hearts to you, God, I pray that even right now those lies that have been told to my neighbor, God, will begin to break up and those, those deceptions and those narratives that cause them to forget who they are will begin to fade to the background. And even at the same time, I pray, God, that who you've created us to be will begin to come to the foreground. I pray, God, that you remind my neighbor that they are your people. Remind them that they are your instruments. Remind them that they are your creation. And that, God, you have given them all they need to be who you've created them to be. And so, God, bless my neighbor. Somebody say, bless my neighbor, God. Open up their eyes, open up their heart, open up their ears, open up their understanding, open up their minds so they can, God, receive and internalize the spirit of the living God that is here to keep reminding us that we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are God's strange, peculiar, called out people. Remind them, God, everywhere they go, God, that they are not defined by what they produce, but they are, God, inherently good because of their proximity and 
generation from you. Now lift your hands where you're standing. God, I pray right now that you will bless those hands that are lifted up, God. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father, my sister, or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord. And I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again. I need you, Lord. I need your love. I need your power. I need your strength. I need your victory. I need your hope. I need your, your forgiveness. I need your strength. I need, God, a double dose of the Holy Ghost to navigate this season. I need your community. I need all the promises that you've made. God, I need you to break, God, the, the, the log jam in my mind. I need you to mend my broken heart. I need you to ease, God, the, the anxiety. God, I need you, God. And I know because I need you, God, you will always meet me at the point of my need. And so I say yes to you. Somebody say yes, Lord. I say yes to your way. Somebody say yes, Lord. I say, God, I surrender to you. Somebody say yes, Lord. And so have your way even in this season. If I need salvation, God, I give my life to you. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And I give you, God, all of my hopelessness all of my sins and in exchange I received the salvation the transformation the spirit that chips away at all the forces that seek to drag me down set me free make me free keep me free in Jesus name we say thank you God clap your hands and give the Lord a praise come on give the Lord a praise can you tell two or three people, don't you forget who you are? Come on, tell them that. Don't you forget it. Don't you forget it. Don't you forget it. Don't you forget it.